Oh my god, look, it's Jean-Paul Gaultier. Bonsoir, my British terms. Who is Jean-Paul Gaultier? Well, he's known for many things. His outrageous, rebellious fashion, nicknamed the Enfant Terrible for it, for his widely adored fragrances with possibly one of the most internationally recognized bottles, for designing many iconic beloved outfits worn by Madonna to the cast of The Fifth Element, and for wearing a kilt while presenting some of the strangest stories from mainland Europe on Eurotrash. He's done it all. He left his mark on the world and fashion, without ever even going to fashion school. Well, I don't think that Jean-Paul Gaultier is underrated. I don't think people appreciate just how creative, inventive, and ahead of his time that he was. I feel like fashion, even today, is generally underappreciated in pop culture. But Jean-Paul Gaultier proved how big of an impact it could have through his vast body of work. So how about you sit back, relax? There's a lot of cool stuff to get through. Let's look at the legacy of Jean-Paul Gaultier. I'm going to be saying his name a lot, so sorry if I butcher it a couple times. Jean-Paul Gaultier was born in Paris to a middle-income family, and he first found a love for fashion from his grandmother, who he would visit each weekend. He first started making clothes for his teddy bear, Nana. He wanted a doll, but his parents did not approve of a boy having a doll but that didn't stop him. See, he still has the bear, and you can see for yourself how, as a five-year-old kid, he created the cone bra that would be made famous by Madonna decades later. A key aspect of his design process has always been sketching, which may sound obvious, but not all designers sketch. Tom Brown designs through solid shapes and lines somehow, and others work straight off a mannequin with fabric. But Jean-Paul Gaultier does these amazing drawings, and a moment that he attributes to his interest in fashion sketching was his exposure to the Folie Berger cabaret girls from a documentary that he saw about them. The day after he saw it, he was bored in class, drawing these cabaret girls girls with the extravagant feathers and outfits. The teacher saw him doing this and to punish him, stuck the drawings to his back and made him walk around the class and show everybody what he'd done. But the other kids in this class actually liked his drawings and wanted him to do some for them. And this just inspired him further. It could have easily gone the other way where, you know, the other kids could have flamed him, which I don't know how big of an effect that could have had on his life, but clearly he remembers the story now as a 70 year old adult. Who knows how it could have turned out different, but thankfully he was praised and encouraged to be himself, not by his teachers or his parents, but by his peers. After finishing school at 18 years old, he sent his drawings to many designers in the hopes of getting work and luckily got the eye of Pierre Cardin, falsely assuming that Jean-Paul must have been a university student or something. I think it again really worked in Jean-Paul's favor that Pierre Cardin of all designers decided to hire him because back then he was about 50 at that point and had a reputation as France's rebellious designer. He pioneered a retro futurist vision of fashion that a lot of people saw as tacky, but a lot of people also loved. He was a very wacky designer. This is the house that he built for himself. It's crazy. According to Jean-Paul, he also cast a diverse range of models, which is something that we'll see Jean-Paul champion in his work as well. Jean-Paul worked for Pierre Cardin on and off and had the freedom to design whatever he wanted to. So I can see how working under such a person would only encourage Jean-Paul to further be himself and dream big. Not all designers and journalists, especially the French ones, were as open-minded as Cardin. And this is how Jean-Paul Gaultier learned about fashion and design. He didn't get any formal training. He was trained through watching movies, seeing the fashion of designers he admired like Yves Saint Laurent, and also working in the industry for Cardin and other designers, which he wasn't as big of a fan of like Jean Patou, but he did it anyway. So Jean-Paul Gaultier basically freelanced through the early 70s, designing clothes that he thought that the designer he was working under would like. But in 1975, he met Francis Minouche, who became his business partner and boyfriend. Jean-Paul referred to himself as more of an abstract rather than ambitious person and said that Francis is the one who encouraged him to design and create his own fashion label because Francis saw that passion in him even when he was lazy and demotivated. So a year later, with barely any money to their name, Jean-Paul Gaultier, with the help of his partner, created his first solo collection, although he would only officially launch his own label a couple of years later. He didn't blow up straight away or anything like that, quite the opposite. He said that his first show was a massive failure, but perhaps with encouragement from Francis, he continued to create. And after that, he did start to garner more attention. He got a lot of attention a few years later in 1980 when he designed women's dresses out of plastic trash bags and bracelets out of tin cans. He said that the French critics initially detested his work and the only journalists and buyers that would come to his shows were British and Japanese. Before I start talking about more of his iconic shows once he started getting popular, I want to talk about some of the ways that Jean-Paul Gaultier was distinct and that led to his success. At the dawn of the 80s, he started to develop quite a love for the UK. In London, the new romantic scene had picked up steam, which gave rise to an active nightclub scene, new artists that were played in these clubs like Boy George and Duran Duran, and most importantly, a plethora of fascinating people who took pride in expressing themselves as much as possible. A notable crazy dresser from this time that Jean-Paul Gaultier and others like Alexander McQueen took inspiration from was Leigh Bowery. Jean-Paul said himself that in London, there were lots of creative people and energy to be inspired by, while in Paris, he felt that it had a lot more boring, chic people who look down at people dressing differently. The London scene became a major source of inspiration and motivation for Jean-Paul, who would go on to create his shows with the same 
to the point but beautiful free spirit that he saw around him there. He loved standing at King's Cross and watching the various types of people who came through there. And I say source of motivation as well because his sources of inspiration were kind of everywhere. You had no idea what his next collection was going to be about. He combined Eastern and Western cultures, radical new ideas to classic designs, integrated new technology into his clothing. There is a Gautier collection that will appeal to everyone in terms of the topics that he's decided to base it around. Whether it's technology, tattooing, or Frida Kahlo. Whether his design is your cup of tea is a completely different story though. But as radical as some of his designs were, he still always aimed to create something pleasant. He wasn't always trying to shock, he was just trying to be himself and show what he found beautiful. I think that one reason that he's responsible for so many iconic designs is because of the variety of things that his collections were about. He didn't hold himself to anything, nothing was off the table, which allowed him to explore various cultures and styles. And I think he always did a really good job honoring the cultures that he was inspired by, as we'll see a little later. After getting some momentum going, he managed to open a fashion house under his own name in 1982, backed by an Italian firm and a Japanese manufacturer. At this point onwards, Jean-Paul Gaultier started to build a reputation for himself as the enfant terrible for his extraordinary design. 1982 was also the first year that he did menswear and when he first incorporated the Breton stripe or the mariniere into his clothes. This is a classic French garment which was originally a part of the French sailor's uniform before Coco Chanel appropriated it into her own wardrobe. The title of his first men's collection was L'homme objet which means man as an object. What did he mean by this? Well, as I explained, he designed from a place of personal expression, which was taken at times as a form of rebellion to the status quo. And this can definitely be seen through how he viewed men and women and his model choices. He refuted the stereotypical image of the submissive woman, which was definitely a much stronger stereotype back then. So he did things like make lingerie and other undergarments like corsets into their own dresses. He dressed women in suits and made them more masculine and in charge of who they were and how they dressed. And for men, well... He believed in equality, right? So with his first collection, L'Homme Objet, he made men more feminine and objectified them as women have been for so long. He came out with the backless marinere t-shirt. And later we see him dressing men in skirts and cutting holes out in traditional men's pieces. Although his purpose was not to demean men, instead give them another side. While he did dress men in some blatantly feminine items, he also delved into the history of men's fashion to empower them in different ways. For the skirts that he dressed them in, he took inspiration from various cultures like the kilts of Scotland and skirts of the Japanese samurai. A few years after this 1982 collection, he released some wide leg pants that had a wrap over panel that made it look like a skirt, which was embraced by David Beckham. Jean-Paul had a strong sense of integrity, and regardless of the outdated norms that were around him, he stuck to what he knew was right. Not only regarding gender, but also regarding race and other things. In the 70s, while working for Jean Patou, he suggested a black model for a certain look, but those above him told him that it wouldn't appeal to the American buyers. And in the same interview, Jean-Paul then said, It was not true because they didn't buy anything, the American buyer, on any buyers in Jean Patou, nobody was buying. <laughs> so when it came to his own collections, there were black models. There were models of all races and sizes and ages and appearances. He cast models that didn't fit the Barbie doll mold like Rossi de Palma, even though I think she looked the best in Jean-Paul Gaultier's 1994 tattoo collection. A year later in 1995, in his cyber show, he had two pregnant models and the daughter, who was inside one of the models' bellies, modeled for Jean-Paul Gaultier when she had all grown up like 20 years later. In the 80s, when he was casting such a diverse range of models, he did get criticism for it. Back then, people were just way too harsh. I think today people aren't harsh enough. Criticism can be a great thing if it comes from the right place. But back then anyone who stepped out of the norms of fashion was criticized. So it's good to see that people are more or less praised for it today. Okay now we can really look at some clothes. There are actually a decent amount of photos of looks of his from the 80s. He created many variations on the cone bra that will make a comeback a bit later. There's even this fez hat bra to bless your eyes. He was one of the first designers to dress men more androgynously on the runway following his L'Homme Objet collection. And I feel like a lot of his ideas for a more varied menswear closet should be revisited today. I hope that you can see for yourself how his style is quite hard to pin down. There is definitely a camp element to a lot of his looks, but I can't deny that a lot of them still come off very cohesive and clean looking. And then there are the ones that are extremely garish and camp. But the 90s is when Jean-Paul really reached his potential and peaked. In the 90s, people started becoming more anti-establishment and hungry for experimentation and excitement. And since Jean Balcote had already been serving that, the 90s is when he grew to his most popular. And his collections during this decade were, in my opinion, his best ever. Although Jean Paul started the new decade with a tragedy in his personal life, his partner of the last 15 years, Francis Manouge, passed away from an AIDS-related illness, which shook him and his community of friends. During this time, he tried his best to remain positive and ended up putting a lot of time into his brand. The 1990 menswear collection was a great twist on classic menswear tropes that covered so much ground. It could have easily made up an entire wardrobe. It hits on 
on so many different moods while still being undeniably masculine, elegant, and camp all at once. One of his best menswear displays. Next, his 1994 show called Les Tatouages is in competition with the next show I'm going to talk about after this for his most iconic. The collection was a cross-cultural mix and mash. While the show was titled after the tattoo motifs that were present throughout the show, there were many stunning designs on display. Denim Trump Loy that we saw Y Project recreate a couple seasons ago, these amazing faux piercings and jewelry found in Hindu and African tribe culture, and subversive classic tailoring which is also commonly seen today. As Gauthier was at his peak at this time, these collections were huge. There were 95 looks on display for this season which is absolutely crazy. The tattoo printed tops were definitely the most distinct other than maybe the piercings and I think these tattoo designs are a great example of how different designers can cover the same topics and still be original. A few years earlier, Margiela, who had previously worked for Gautier, came out with his own tattoo print mesh top. It's clear how Jean-Paul Gautier expanded on the idea and made it his own. He wasn't inspired by Margiela's top necessarily, but by a tattoo convention that he attended in the UK. And Issey Miyake was the first to come out with a tattoo top years before Margiela did. He was inspired by Yakuza tattoo culture. Just because something has been done doesn't mean it can't be done better or in a different way. As I said, the Breton stripe had been very popular popular in fashion before Jean-Paul. But after Jean-Paul, the Breton stripe has taken on so many more forms. Jean-Paul Gaultier was actually the first to show the split toe tabby design on the runway, after he and his team, including Margiela, had taken a trip to Japan. But the reason Margiela is known for the tabby is because Margiela put a heel on it and made it into a leather boot, while Gaultier didn't really develop the tabby into anything more. Maybe Margiela had the idea back then, but uh, kept it for himself instead of letting Gaultier take the credit. Jean-Paul Gaultier's Fall 95 Cyber Collection is the other show battling out for his most well-known. As the 90s were progressing, many fashion designers were experimenting with new technology. Helmut Lang and Walter van Berendonck started recording their shows and sharing them online. Jean-Paul Gaultier was experimenting with what the future would look like by using new programs to help with his actual design process, and it helped him create these amazing colorful halftone prints of a woman's body. And he would go on to use halftones further to make even more great garments. In Spring Summer 96, here's one shirt that was famously worn by Robin Williams, and the look has since been revived after Y2K started getting popular. Although this kind of cyber look belongs to the late 90s, real Y2K fashion is more Ed Hardy and Juicy Couture. But back to the Cyber Collection. Like any Gautier show, it was an eclectic mix with more than just cyber halftone looks on display. This collection has also been referred to as his Mad Max collection for being held in a dark industrial space and the collection opening to the roar of models on a motorbike going down the runway in black leather. But this was a femme-centric Mad Max interpretation. As he says, it was for the Amazonian woman who was courageous, confident, and very much in control of her life. The collection featured Carmen Delorefis, known for being one of the oldest working models. In this show, she walked with an eagle on her arm, aged 64. She was 64, the eagle was only 60 in eagle years. There were also two pregnant models dressed in all black leather. Later came these bright looks that were being inflated by a hair dryer that the models held as they walked. And there's much more to this collection. It's just, it has 105 looks to go through. Although if you want to learn more, Vogue made a great video covering it and talking to the people who were there at the time from the models who walked in it and Jean-Paul Gaultier himself. At this point, you can see for yourself, Jean-Paul Gaultier is producing 100 looks per show in completely full venues wherever he wanted to. The next reasonable step for him to take was haute couture. And the way he started his haute couture was rather amusing. He recalled that Bernard Arnault, of all people, was looking for a new designer for Dior in 1996. And Jean-Paul received a call, but was disappointed to find out that he had been catfished and the vacancy that was offered to him was at Givenchy, not Dior. A brand that he didn't particularly care for and called a ripoff of other brands like Dior and Yves Saint Laurent. Arnaud told Gautier that it would bring him more attention, which just annoyed Jean-Paul Gautier even more, considering his shows were already the hottest at Fashion Week season after season. As we know today, Alexander McQueen took the job begrudgingly. He also didn't care for Givenchy, but took it because it was a well-paid job and he was just starting out. This, however, inspired Gautier to simply start his own haute couture line that he'd always dreamed of doing since he was a child, and he had the money to do so. Through his ready-to-wear line, but also from the fragrance line he had launched in 1993, which by 96 had sold 40 million bottles. And so the very next year, he debuted his first haute couture collection in spring 97. And this collection was as iconoclastic as any other Jean-Paul Gaultier show. A couple novel ideas that he brought to couture was firstly adding men into the mix, because men deserve haute couture as well. And while he honored the craft with many finely tailored looks and gowns, he also clashed against traditional ideals of couture, using denim, brand logos, and visible garment tags, things more associated with ready-to-wear and and casual clothing. All this contrasted the level of fantasy and dress up that those around him like McQueen and Galliano were doing. And I think the show had a pretty straightforward sentiment of Gautier wanting to make couture, which is the highest quality best made garments that money can buy, 
on his own terms. That being said, he also had some fantasy of his own to present, such as this tropical bird look that looks like something modern Ace Schiaparelli would come out with. It's interesting to see Balenciaga take a similar approach with their couture 20 years later, bringing denim and more casual garments into the mix. Fashion really is just cyclical how we've seen it all before. Some other shows that I won't go more in depth on, but I also really liked, was his Spring Summer 98 Frida Kahlo inspired show, his Fall Winter 94 show with Bjork, and the Spring Summer 96 show that featured the abs Trump Loy shirt that Robin Williams wore. I can't make a video about Jean Paul Gaultier without mentioning his impact on pop culture. Obviously, he had a public artistic relationship with Madonna. He admired her provocative demeanor, and the feeling was mutual. They met each other in a party in Paris, and Jean Paul saw that she was wearing a corset that was supposed to be like a ripoff of one of his designs. And in the moment, he told her that in the future, she could call him to design a whole wardrobe for her. Well, a few months later, she rang him up to design her 1990 Blonde Mishes tour wardrobe. And it apparently took multiple calls and a fax in order to convince Jean-Paul Gaultier that it was the real Madonna calling. So he took his cone design and put it on her. He said that he saw Madonna as such a commanding showwoman and that she has such a chiseled masculine face. So that's why he wanted to put the harsh contrasting cone bra to match her personality and features. Unfortunately, I've never really been a big fan of Madonna. She was a bit before my time. So I appreciate what he did there, but his work for The Fifth Element appeals to me a lot more. That movie was also before my time, but I've since seen it and loved it. It's a jokingly serious sci-fi movie with some of the best retro futurist fashion that any sci-fi movie has to offer. The movie was directed by French director Luc Besson, so that's how Jean-Paul Gaultier got involved with the project. He designed every outfit, the airline hostesses, Bruce Willis's, and Lilou's, Chris Tucker's amazing character's outfit too. If you've never seen The Fifth Element, it's it's great for the outfits alone. But the rest of the movie is also entertaining. One of the last major steps Gaultier took in his career was from 2003 to 2010, where he succeeded Margiela at Hermes. While Margiela went for a very elegant, clean, chic, you could say, take that really highlighted Hermes's craftsmanship, Gaultier Hermes experimented a lot more with silhouette and he definitely brought a bit of his campness to Hermes while still maintaining the brand's elegant feel. I found this move quite interesting. Hermes was clearly interested in Gautier because in 1999 they acquired a 35% stake in his company. But Hermes and Gautier don't feel like brands that really mesh together stylistically or ideologically. But who's to say you can't enjoy both brands' approach? Gautier continued the same approach he had from the 80s, 90s into the 2000s. And while his brand never fell off or anything like that, interests in fashion obviously changes. But Jean-Paul Gautier? Timeless. As he got older though, he inevitably started winding back at his brand. He stopped doing ready to wear it in 2014 and stuck solely to haute couture. But in January 2020, in very timely fashion, considering what was to come, Jean-Paul Gaultier retired from fashion with his very last couture show. But the brand still lives on. I think Jean-Paul Gaultier has taken the perfect approach for the future of his brand. He's never been a businessman, really. He's always loved the art and self-expression of fashion. And so his strategy for the future of his brand is to continue the haute couture shows each season and have them be guest designed by whatever designer he he wishes to see remix his archive. So far, he's had absolute stars designing for him in Chitose Abe, Glenn Martins, Olivier Rustang, and Heider Ackerman. Let's just say he has good taste. I think having new designers come in each season is a great way to let designers get a taste of haute couture and design freely without the pressure of reaching certain margins on sales and without having to sacrifice their own brand in the process. And Jean-Paul Gaultier's brand gets to live on in such an exciting, appropriate way because each season, we don't know who's going to be the designer. So as the audience, we have no idea what to expect. And so far, I've been really impressed with the guest design haute couture that the house has come out with. And Jean-Paul Gaultier himself isn't just sitting idly watching others design while he's retired. He's moved on to theater, where he created his own show called Jean-Paul Gaultier's Fashion Freak Show, which recounts his life through live performance, taking him to the many clubs and parties he frequented when he was younger. Check it out at a theater near you, maybe if you live in Munich or Tokyo. Yeah, that's about it. Uh, I tried to keep it relatively concise. I've obviously left a lot on the table for you to go learn about yourself. Of all designers out there, Jean-Paul Gaultier has always been one of my favorites. So I hope you come to feel the same about him, if he is to your taste. If you want to learn about some other great designers that are a bit nicher, I've done a Patreon video touching on the careers of Hane Mori, the designer that came before Issey Miyake, Rei Kawakubo, all of the popular Japanese designers we know today. Oswald Boateng, the youngest Savile Row tailor, and AF Vandervoorst, a super creative Belgian label. I also put out another video reacting to and Alexander McQueen doc. I release videos every week on Patreon. It's only five euro a month if you're interested in joining and supporting this channel. Okay, I'll stop e-begging now. Thanks for watching. Bye. See you next time. Your trash, please don't play this video if I use some of your clips. Please. I'm just joking around. Come on. I'm just trying to have some